you guys look really serious, man. It's, uh, I'm getting a vibe like you better be interesting and informative. Now chill out, we're gonna have some fun, okay? So, has anyone heard about the theory of fragmentation? You, okay, you too, but, but I've spoken to you about that before. It's normal, because I just came up with the term, okay? So, are these working? Not yet. Wake up. <laughs> Forget it, I'll just start off without it anyways. Uh, theory of fragmentation. So, I've been noticing something because I've been working with technology for a while now. Uh, in my day job, I do a lot of work with uh, some forms of machine intelligence and natural language processing. And in my Batman life, I've been doing a lot of work with blockchain, all right? And what I've realized, oh, yeah, hallelujah. What I've realized is as I've been working with technology over and over again, you see a repeating kind of a pattern in the way that technology affects us. So to give you some context and to get you in, into my mindset, we're going to do some time traveling, okay? It's 1455, and you are on the mean streets of Mainz in Germany. 1455 is a very important date. That's when the printing press was invented, all right? And if I were to come up to you, I'm a surveyor in, in, in Germany, and I come up to you and I say, hey, have you heard about the printing press? You being the very suave, debonair kind of person that you are, you're like, of course I know about the printing press, man. Who doesn't? And then I say that, okay, fine, in the next 30 years, do you think this one technological innovation is going to undermine the authority of the Catholic Church, create the Protestant Reformation, create something called modern science, which hadn't existed till then. It's going to lead to the creation of a number of jobs, industries, and professions which we've not even dreamed of. And finally, it's going to change our conception of childhood, social order, and prosperity. What's your response going to be? Uh, there you go, yeah? yeah I, mean, you're going to, I mean, honestly, you're going to tell me what? You, you must be out of your mind, man. Like, what are you smoking? You know, share it with me, at least. Uh, and this is essentially what we saw actually happened. 30 years into this technology's invention, and it got inside over here, and it got combined with another interesting technology, which was gunpowder. Gunpowder was existed before that, but it was introduced into Western society only around that point, in the 15th century onwards. And when these two technologies bombarded the existing social order, it created something which essentially is fragmenting the order that existed before. Before all of that, this was the order that existed. You had the church on the top, and they got this position because they unified serfdoms, collected taxes, and essentially dictated policies, working along with the monarchs and the kings and all that, and everyone else underneath that, okay, the plebs. This was the existing structure for around 500 years. And then something very interesting happened. As the church got bigger and bigger and involved in more and more things about how society needed to function, it went from being a moral compass, which it never actually has been, to becoming something which is more of a bureaucratic machine. There was too much information that was being trying to be managed with these um, archaic tools that they had. And then what happens is you get these new, two new technologies that come in. Gunpowder is interesting because gunpowder allowed monarchs to scale the kind of war that they were doing, right? But there was a problem with gunpowder. It's expensive. So what do the monarchs do? They started telling people that we can't just get money from, from taxes. We're going to issue licenses for the production of any good or service that you want. You want to make a belt pocket, you want to make a button, doesn't matter. You need to have a license for it. And if you have a license for it, you've got to pay revenue, right? It's very important to understand this point, ladies and gentlemen, because it shows you the link. It's a very intrinsic link between technology and economics. You can't separate the two. As a result of that, you had the landlords and the traders, you know, the new kind of quasi-aristocracy that entered. The structure of the existing paradigm started to shatter a little bit. Fast forward around 300 years, and what do you have? The printing press came inside at the same point as well. More and more people started learning. They saw that there was a possibility for moving from the lower strata to somewhere in between by learning how to do something different, exchanging ideas, learning about technology, etc., etc. And you get this new structure, which is the Industrial Revolution. You know, the, the, the princes and the church, they've gone away. I mean, they're still there, but they're like ambiance. They don't really do anything anymore. What you have instead is the oil tycoons and the railway tycoons and the steam industry people and all those different people. And they've got a new kind of uh, social strata that they've created, something I'm sure all of us are very familiar with, management. 
right? It's the organizational man, that guy who wakes up at 9 a.m. and he's over there. And what is the organizational man doing more than anything else? He's taking information from the bottom, passing it up on top, and taking decisions from the top and passing it downstairs. And for a long time, this was the existing model. Matter of fact, this might look familiar. This is essentially what we have today. It's come from that. But why is it more fragmented? What we realized at one point of time was the amount of information that was coming up was so much that you couldn't have effective decision making. If you want to use a system dynamics term, you could say that the throughput of decisions to information was, going on, was undergoing a kind of change, a kind of out of kilter kind of situation. And so we did what? We adapted to it by fragmenting our industries and our companies even more. We made departments, marketing, finance, et cetera, et cetera. And this is essentially the structure that we have today. Okay, so this is like the history lesson. This is for you to get from where we were to what's actually going on over here. And what I'm going to show you in a bit is that this model is also failing today. And we have to start thinking about a new model which is going to be more fragmented. Okay, every time I do a dramatic pause, I'm going to say more fragmented. Right? So, to kind of get an understanding of the situation, the gravitas of the situation, 1920s, average age of a company, 67 years. Today, 15 years. This isn't slowing down, it's accelerating. And to kind of understand why it's happening, you've got to understand two things. The first is how does technology evolve? And the second is the economic channels through which we get access to technology. Now, to talk about the first thing, how technology evolves, I've studied this a little bit, and the person that I find who gives the best guide is Kevin Kelly, all right? Kevin Kelly, founder of Wired Magazine, all around great guy, I've read a lot of his work, and he came up with this really simple kind of pattern. He said that every time there's a technology, it goes through an evolutionary kind of a curve. It starts off by being something that's very, very specialized, okay? Because it's specialized, it's used in a few small places, it's scarce. What happens when something is scarce? The value goes up. Be it gold, be it Bitcoin, same difference. It's scarce, people want to have it, and they're willing to pay a lot of money for it. After a while, technology has got this weird tendency. It feeds off other technology. It will mix with other kinds of technology. It starts getting a bit more diverse. Electricity is a great example for it, right? Started off as being something very, very simplistic. Today, it's invisible. So it starts getting a bit more diverse. As it gets diverse, you can start using it in places to solve problems that it was not originally made to do. And when that happens, it starts becoming increasingly ubiquitous. It's something which is now you're using it all the time. AI is kind of going through this phase right now. Blockchain is somewhere in between over there as well, right? When that happens, people start exchanging about it, they start talking about it, but the reason that they do that is because the cost of it is going down bit by bit because it's getting used more and more and more. It starts becoming extremely social. And from that point to getting complex, it's a very, very short curve, right? And it's important to come back to this point that I mentioned about the link between economic channels and technology evolution. Because the first time that we really started to pay attention to this was when information technology started getting created. So one of the first people to understand this was Bruce Henderson. For those of you who don't know who Bruce is, he is the founder of BCG, Boston Consulting Group. And he came up with something which is known as scale maximization, which in very layman's terms is essentially the more and more you do something, the better you get at it, you get economies of scale. So you get a new technology, you figure out how to use it, it gets cheaper and cheaper to do it, and then you get economies of scale. He said that in 1975. Five years later, Michael Porter comes on board and says, I'm going to refine what Bruce Henderson said just a little bit more. And what Porter said was, essentially, the reason why it's getting cheaper and cheaper and getting used more and more is because of transaction costs and value chains. When we make a product or a service, it goes from part A to part B to part C. That's the value chain. In between each part of the value chain, you have transaction costs, which are essentially information costs, information processing costs, pardon me, and communication costs. Information technologies, like the internet, reduce the cost of that. What happens is the glue between each of these value chains starts to disintegrate. You're seeing the same pattern of fragmentation repeat itself all over again, right? This is the reason why technology works this way. It evolves because as we use it, the cost starts coming down. As the cost starts coming down, we start using it in different kinds of places. And at one point of time, it's accessible to all of us. And as a result of it, it fragments an ex existing structure. Now, I jumped a slide too fast. 
What I'm going to do is, I'm going to talk about how this is actually affecting us today. But rather than giving you some theoretical model, I'm going to give you examples so that you kind of get your own idea as to how this is working. So the first example that I'm going to talk about is blockchain. All right? Today, everyone's jonesing for the blockchain. Right? Got to get some blockchain. Got to get some of it. Got to get into an ICO. I've been doing blockchain for five years. When we first started talking about blockchain, the use cases were payments and remittances. Because that's what it is. It reduces the cost of sending value from point A to point B. Right? But guess what happened? It started getting used more and more. More people started getting inside of it. More people started understanding it. Exchange of ideas, creativity, blah, 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 blah. The next thing you know, it starts getting used pretty much everywhere. End of 2017, Swith and Crown put this out online. You're seeing now ICOs or the use of blockchain from pretty much any sector. It started off with payments, huh? That, that was the big one. But now it's everywhere, from uh, real estate, transportation, to food delivery with a drone. Let me repeat that. A blockchain-based model that does food delivery with a drone. Word. But that's what they're doing today, right? And there's someone over here who said, yes, that means you've invested in the ICO, and I know which one it is. <laughs> so this is actually like a micro-level concept of how technology is fragmenting an existing structure, or in this case, multiple in industries. Let's take it to an individual structure, because I want you to be able to see how you're going to be impacted by it. So just to carry on with the um, macro structure, I wanted to put this in, because this is a project that I'm involved in, and it gives a re very, very good idea. And it's happening right now. The online booking industry, which is only around two decades old, by the way. I'm talking Expedia, Priceline, these kind of companies. Two decades old. If you go and try and get a hotel or a flight over there, first of all, you've got to pay 25% in commission costs. Why? Because they can say so. They're an oligopoly. If you're someone who's providing the service, you've got to pay anywhere between 15 to 35% in transmission in commission costs. Secondly, if you want your result to come up on the first page, guess what? You've got to pay more. So what these guys have come up with is they said, you know what, what we're going to do, we're going to use the blockchain and completely decimate this. We're going to create an open, easy to access, free to use platform in which essentially you can come up over there and meet directly the end user that you, you're looking for or vice versa. What they have essentially done with this business model, and it's getting a lot of traction today, is that they have fragmented the online booking sector, which is only two decades old. Okay, so this is a sectorial web point of view. From an individualistic point of view, I'm going to use the example of this handsome bastard. Uh, does anyone actually know who he is? Yeah, yes, a couple of you know that, right? He's Mark Esposito. He's a very good friend of mine. He's my mentor. Um, and uh, he's a rock star, Harvard-educated professor. Now, I like to call uh, Mark the poor business student's Jordan Peterson. I'm not really sure if he agrees with that nickname, but I'm bigger than him, so this is what it is. <laughs> So what did Mark do? Mark's very inspiring for a number of reasons. And one of the first things that Mark did was he was someone who was always quite frustrated with the way academia was evolving. And what he did was he used a lot of the socially accessible tools that we have today, such as Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, and he got out there and he started talking about it, trying to look at other people who are looking at the same situation his way and offering his own perspective. He could do all of this because the cost of sending his ideas out there was very, very low. Bit by bit, he starts attracting a different kind of a crowd. He starts creating a new kind of a tribe, much bigger than him. It leads to him working in different kinds of projects. This is a project that him and I personally worked on together. It was for the European Defense Agency. It was on circular economics in the, in the defense sector. Very interesting work. And in the process of doing so, what happened? He started understanding more about how technology is affecting business models. He self-learned about it. I mean, he's a very smart man. And in the process of doing so, now I've created his own company based on it, which offers AI-based business solutions. He's still Mark Esposito, the Harvard prof. He gives a lot of classes. He's a very good teacher. I know it because I was a student. But he's also got a fragmented identity in three different areas today. And this is the key point, ladies and gentlemen. Fragmentation is no longer just happening at the level of a sector or an industry. It's happening at the level of the individual. Okay. If he's too much out there, as an example, I'll, I'll give something that's a lot more closer to heart. Vice magazine recently did a documentary on this guy. His name is uh, Jehu Garcia. And what Jehu did was he's an electrical engineer, trained electrical engineer, works in you know, a company, whatever. 
He buys the power wall, Tesla's power wall. Goes back home, puts it up, opens it up as any good engineer would, and figures out how it works. He then realizes that he can create pretty much the same thing using rechargeable batteries, right? Not only does he create these, these little boards, that it's called a do-it-yourself do kit. He puts it up on YouTube, bit by bit he gets more and more people coming towards him, exchanging ideas. They create a new service, which is a microgrid in the area in which they live, in which they retrofit existing cars which use combustion engines with electrical power wall based do-it-yourself kits. They are fragmenting the energy sector within their own local community, right? That's what essentially what's happening. And he's still got his job, but he's also a YouTube personality. For all you Instagram freaks out there, some of you might know this guy. Okay, he's called the Swim Reaper. This was actually a program that started off by the New Zealand uh, Water Safety Board or something. So he, he's like a legit lifeguard. This is not what, what he does. But they started doing this because he goes out there, he talk, tells people to be a bit safe, you know, don't do something crazy. And they have this outfit and he's, you know, he's doing his thing. When I looked at this, I was like, sounds cool, you know, it's fun, that was about it. Then I came across this number. Yeah. You can make money doing this. And this is what I'm talking about by, by this th whole theory of fragmentation. It's fragmenting us at the level of the individual, which means that we can now communicate with different people, use technology, different kinds of technologies, especially if they're automated, to create new kinds of models. And essentially, you have multiple identities, all of which have a revenue stream. Hmm? And the reason that I'm specifying all of these things is because it's accessible to everyone. We're entering a world today in which each one of us, using different kinds of technologies and tools, Slack, for example, was a great one, okay? We can now go ahead and actually do something in which uh, Tiago uh, Forte calls the full-stack freelancer. You're a professor, it's okay. You don't have to just give you know, classes and uh, publish papers. You can talk about your things, you can write books in, in coordination with other people, you can learn about new subjects and adapt it to your area of expertise and put that out there and create a, a, your own value chain based on that. And this is not going away. The gig economy, this is what the FT had published earlier this year, I think this was in January, in which they found that the gig economy is going to grow from 14 billion, what it is today, to two, 335 billion by 2025. It's no longer some trend. This is kind of the way that we are going to be thinking about how we make our living. Which brings me to the most important slide, in my opinion. Not this one, it's the next one. <laughs> But this, this, is, this is a very interesting one as well, in which you look at the, the individual reputation that you have. It is now a sum of the aggregate reputations you have on all the different platforms in which you sell yourself. You can do certain kinds of tasks. You can put those tasks out there. You can communicate with other kinds of people. You can go on websites like colony.io, find your own tribe, work on a project by yourself, and every place that you go, you have a different identity, which is fragmented from an existing one always based on the kind of task that you're doing. It's leading us to this, the task-based economy. You can think very simply in the future, not too far from now, that the existing mechanistic hierarchies which we have been learning and working with for most of our lives are essentially going to be replaced by a task-based one in which you get up over there, you have a certain reputation for doing certain kinds of tasks, and you have multiple platforms on which you can actually sell these tasks. It's leading to something uh, which is collective, the collectivistic ethic, which we had learned you know, by working in these large organizations. It's getting replaced by a certain kind of rugged individualism, in which there is a certain kind of liberation that is happening as these structures break down. In the same way that we saw all through history, it's happened with gunpowder, it's happened with the printing press, now it's blockchain, it's AI, doesn't matter what the technology is, the effect is always the same. And the funny part about it, it's not even something that's new. 1857, Herbert Spencer, he said this, you want to find out about transformation? Look at how things go from homogenous to heterogeneous. It's always the same. Doesn't matter what the scale is, cosmic scale, or even at the level of a civilization. It's always the same. And that's the key point that I'm trying to give you, ladies and gentlemen. If you can understand this kind of a structure, then it helps you kind of navigate what's going on around you. It's very easy to get boggled by the overload of information and say, oh my god, I don't know about this technology. But there are ways to adapt, but for that you first need to know what the environment is in which you're playing. This is the new kind of model that we're going towards. 
task-based. You have a certain identity, you can do certain kinds of tasks. Based on that, you communicate with other people, and you can come up with new ways in order to find out. Now, a good part in this is, if you want to be able to find out uh, who the kind of person is that you want to work with, you've always got to go for cognitive diversity. Okay, I think someone was talking before about creativity. How does creativity actually come about? It doesn't come by having the same kind of people like you around you. You need people who think differently. And often the diversity conversation is relegated to gender. I'm not saying that that's not an important point. It's a very important point. But if you're thinking about coming up with new kinds of ideas, you have to have people who can look at the same situation as you, but make a decision in a very different kind of a way. Different perceptions, different heuristics, coming up with different kinds of judgment-based models. And it's very human-centric. One of the final points that I want to make with all of this is, what is AI actually doing? AI is reducing the cost of prediction. That's what AI is good at. When we first started hearing about AI and machine learning, it was Gary Kasparov and IBM Deep Blue. Today, you can use uh, machine learning in order to find out if you, you know, a cat is happy or sad. That's kind of what pattern recognition actually helps you do. It reduces the cost of making a, a prediction. But any task has got a number of subcomponents. It's got information coming in. You're making a judgment based on that, and then you lead to a decision. The prediction model is in between. If the prediction is getting cheaper because of AI, guess where the value comes up? It's in the decision making and the judgment. And if you're trying to figure out how you can adapt with AI, that's kind of like the thing you've got, got, got to look at. I'm going to finish up with this. What we all need to start thinking about is if we need to adapt to this kind of fragmenting uh, environment, the only way that you can do that is by respecting it. The best way any ad ad species adapts to something is by reflecting its outside environment. And so one takeaway that I would suggest that all of you take from this conversation is that look at what you're doing today. What is the sector that you're working in? What is the task and the skills that you're able to perform? How many of them are getting automated? And how can you fragment yourself and find out the other kinds of people who can work with you in order to create a new kind of value which respects this changing environment? I'm here all afternoon for any more questions. Thank you very much.